Um, I wrote Skin uh, when I was quite ill, actually. I was bedridden for a period with a, some sudden onslaught of arthritis, and I was bored. And I began writing Skin in two, the year 2000. And it was published in 2001 by Penguin India, and then went into translation in several countries. Um, the subtext of Skin is the Portuguese slave trade in Goa. It is set in Goa, Angola, and Mozambique, and a little bit in California because uh, the vehicle of narration is an uh, Goan Indian expat who is raised in the U.S., much like myself, except that I was raised in Venezuela and not in the U.S., who returns to Goa to discover her roots. And in that trajectory, she discovers that her family, uh, her Hindu ancestors um, have in several centuries ago, maybe 300 or 350 centuries, I mean 350 years earlier, they were slave traders and she's shocked. And then so the story of the slave trade and her antecedents and um, quite a bit of mixing and matching of genes over these centuries of 450 years of Portuguese colonial rule in Goa is the backdrop of the story of skin. And skin since then has, it was in print for, it had a shelf life of about 11 years in India, which is a good long run. And uh, uh, then I had given it to an indie publisher in Goa to uh, as a title, and it's still, I think, available with that indie publisher. But interestingly enough, Skin has taken on a bit of a life of its own. Uh, it has been picked up and put on uh, university syllabuses all over the world, uh, addressing uh, the Portuguese colonial period, and has become kind of a poster child for post-colonial literature in several universities, including Yale, where I was invited a year, I think, or two years ago to assist with the uh, composition of a symposium on Portuguese post-colonial literature. Well, yeah, the, the, the title uh, is multi-layered in its significance because in the book, of course, I'm, I'm addressing uh, skin color on one level uh, because the protagonist of the story is very uh, light-skinned and the Indian grandmother of the protagonist is also quite light-skinned and she, according to her, is a descendant of Saraswat Brahmins. There's an interesting dynamic in Goa that has occurred over the centuries, which is that, uh, in terms of caste, that the, the Brahmins, who, the Hindu Brahmins who converted to Catholicism, did so with the intention of, or with the idea that the Portuguese would not remain long in India. And they would go ahead with this conversion temporarily for the time being, and when the Portuguese left, then they would go back to their Hindu roots. And the idea was to protect their property, because the Portuguese were offering them uh, the advantage of retaining their lands and assets, provided they converted. So often, uh, among the Hindu Brahmin, Brahm the Saraswat Brahmins of Goa, um, part of the family would convert and the rest of the family would retain the, de the Hindu deity and the name and, and, and maybe cross the border or remain in Goa, but the Catholic convert would retain the properties. But nobody expected that the Portuguese would be there for 450 years. So we have an unusual term in Goa known as the Catholic Brahmin. And the caste structure in Goa, and I presume in the rest of the country, is so strong 
that until now, 450 years later, Catholics who converted X number of centuries ago still know who are their Hindu cousins in Goa and who they're related to. And so, hence, we have a term in Goa known as Catholic Brahmin. Now, I've made a bit of fun of that, and the, and the Saraswat Brahmins tend to have light colored eyes and light skin, much like the protagonist of skin who, who cannot really identify where her green eyes come from, whether it's from her American side or whether it's from her Indian side, nor her light skin. And her grandmother is constantly telling her, don't go into the sun, you will become dark. And the irony of it is that uh, in, it turns out that in the gene pool of this family, there have been, there's been quite a lot of mixing up of genes. So nobody is of any pure race or caste in the family anymore. Well, um, clearly, I mean, a, a, a territory that was dominated by Portuguese colonial rule until 1961, um, it is directly re relevant to post-colonial, uh, to the post-colonial period. And my book covers, um, it's set in the six, it, it ranges in its setting from the 16th century to the present. So therefore there is a certain kind of evolution that would be relevant in post-colonial discourse. Uh, it was well, not intentionally, but clearly um, I, the protagonist uh, identifies with her uh, ancestral roots and has more of an affinity with her Indian side than her American, American side in the book. As I suppose do I, because I uh, did quite the opposite of many of my Indian cousins and instead of going to the U.S., although I studied there in college, after college, I came to India, and whereas all my contemporaries and peers in my family were like going to the U.S. to make their lives and careers, and I have been in India for the past 30 years. Well, I'm really interested in oral tradition, so the history is brought in through stor stories and through matrilineal uh, tales, because um, she, the, the protagonist, although she, you don't discover this until well towards the end of the book, the, her Aya, who is um, of African descent and a, a descended from former slaves that were uh, owned by this particular family, begins to tell her the story of her antecedents, a completely alternate narrative than the one she has believed growing up, and introduces the African heritage that she has. And so that begins with the slave trade, and the Portuguese began their slave trade in the 16th century and did not con really conclude it to my understanding until the 19th century, the early 19th century.